chapter four of the tower of london by arthur poyser this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four a walk round the tower these manacles upon my arm i as my mistress favours wear and for to keep my ankles warm i have some iron shackles there these walls are but my garrison this cell which men call jail doth prove my citadel old ballad on leaving the tower gateway we turn into the gardens on the right and walk along the pathway that lies beneath tower hill and above the moat an excellent view is to be obtained from these gardens of the outer defences of the tower the western front exhibits a striking mass of buildings of various age and colour at first glance we might imagine we were looking upon a bit of sixteenth century nuremberg we would not be at all surprised to see hans sachs veit pogner or sixtus beckmaster look out from the windows above the ballium wall below lie the casemates or outer defences running on this western side from the byward tower to legg's mount named it is conjecture after lord legg earl of dartmouth who had charge of the battery in the seventeenth century the outward wall was put up by henry the third the Deverue tower this tower stands at the northwest angle of the ballium wall above legs mount's battery robert Deverue, earl of essex and friend of shakespeare was a prisoner here in elizabeth's reign hence the name but in earlier days it was known as robin the devil's or devilin tower it is so termed in the fifteen ninety seven plan reproduced at the end of this book the lower and older portion of the tower dates back to the time of richard i the upper portions are modern restorations of what had existed previously but the arrow slits which formerly pierced the walls and admitted so little light to the interior of one of the gloomiest towers in the fortress are now widened to windows the walls are eleven feet thick and a small staircase leads from the tower to cells lying within the thickness of the ballium wall the lower floor contains an old kitchen with finely vaulted ceiling beneath this there is a forbidding dungeon and underground passages at one time led thence to the vaults of st peter's church but the secret subways are now sealed up and their existence probably forgotten flint bower and brick towers these towers lie along the northern section of the inner wall and are protected by the outer wall and also by the comparatively modern north bastion which projects into the ditch and is pierced for successive tiers containing five guns each the flint tower is next in order after the deverer and lies some ninety feet away an older tower on this site known as little hell because of its evil reputation as a prison had fallen partly to ruin in seventeen ninety six and was demolished the present tower was set up in its place and though used as a prison for a few years after the rebuilding has practically no history as it now stands the barrier tower next in order eastwards was the place of confinement of the luckless duke of clarence who suffered a mysterious death in fourteen seventy eight the lower portions of the structure date back to edward the third all above is of more recent date this tower had always an evil reputation one of the most terrible cells of the fortress one authority states is to be found in the boyer tower where there is a ghastly hole with a trap-door opening upon a flight of steps from these steps a secret passage led through a small cell to a farther cell in the body of the ballium wall it is possible that scott had this tower in mind when describing the dungeon and secret passages and doors in the thirteenth chapter of the legend of montrose the account of the one resembles very closely what we know of the other the bow-maker lived and followed his trade within this tower and it is named after that master craftsman whose workshop was a busy place in the days before the bullet had ousted the arrow the brick tower is chiefly of interest as having been the place to which raleigh was moved during his first and third imprisonments 
when it was found necessary to keep him in closer captivity than had been imposed on him in the garden house and bloody tower he was brought to the brick tower and not to the cell in st john's crypt as tradition has led many to believe lord grey de wilton died here during his captivity in sixteen seventeen here also sir william coventry was confined for a time in charles the second's time pepys on his visit to sir william found abundance of company with him and sixty coaches stood outside tower gates that had brought them thither the martin tower this is the most famous of the lesser towers and is also known as the old jewel house it too in part is ancient but the building set up by henry the third was tampered with by wren and has in consequence a somewhat patchy appearance to-day the tower stands at the northeast corner of the inner wall and beneath it lies brass mount battery it is best seen from the point where we leave the public gardens and go on to the level of the tower bridge approach from this recently constructed roadway a good general view of the tower buildings on the eastern side is obtained but we will pause here on our walk to consider two memorable events in the history of the martin tower in may sixteen seventy one that audacious rascal colonel blood whose spirit toiled in framing the most daring enterprises after having failed to seize his ancient enemy the duke of ormond in the streets of london bethought him of a plan to seize and carry away the crown jewels of england then kept in the martin tower it was soon after the appointment of sir gilbert talbot as master or keeper of the jewels that the regalia had been opened to public inspection and an old servant of sir gilbert's talbot edwards was in immediate charge of the room in which the gems lay blood had been making one or two visits in various disguises to the jewel room during the last weeks of april of the year mentioned the date is sometimes given as sixteen seventy three but evelyn mentions the affair in his diary under may tenth sixteen seventy one in order to make sure of his ground and to devise plans of safe retreat blood in disguise of a clergyman and addressed as parson blood had been invited to dine with edwards and his wife and daughter you have said the cassocked colonel a pretty young gentlewoman for your daughter and i have a young nephew who has two or three hundred a year in land and is at my disposal if your daughter be free and you approve it i'll bring him here to see her and we will endeavour to make it a match the day that he had chosen to introduce his nephew was the day on which he was to make his own attempt to steal more than a maiden's heart at the time appointed parson blood returned with three more all armed with rapier canes and every one a dagger and a brace of pocket pistols blood and two of his associates went in to see the crown and the pretended nephew remained at the door as sentinel miss edwards with maidenly modesty forbore to come down and meet her wooer yet curiosity impelled her to send a waiting-maid to inspect the company and report as to the appearance of her lover the maid having seen whom she took to be the intended bridegroom standing at the door of the jewel-room returned to her mistress and analyzed the impression of the young man which she had formed with womanly intuition by a single glance meanwhile it was not love but war below old talbot edwards had been gagged and nearly strangled by blood and his men but not before he had made as much noise as possible in order to raise an alarm the young women upstairs were much too interested in cupid's affairs to hear the cries from the jewel chamber edwards received several blows on the head with a mallet in order that his shouts might be silenced he fell to the ground and was left there as dead while the ruffians were busily despoiling the jewel-case of its more precious contents blood as chief conspirator secured the crown and hid it under his cloak his trusty parrot secreted the orb and the third villain proceeded to file the sceptre in order to get it into a small bag at that moment a dramatic event upset their calculations 
one can almost hear the chord in the orchestra and imagine that a transpontine melodrama was being witnessed when told that there stepped upon the scene at this juncture a son of talbot edwards who had just returned from flanders young edwards on entering his own house was surprised by the sentinel at the door asking him what his business might be he ran upstairs in some amazement to see his father mother and sister and asked the meaning of this demand blood and his precious suite of booty snatchers received the alarm from the doorkeeper and the interesting party made off as quickly as they could with cloaks bags pockets and hands full of crown jewellery the property of his majesty king charles and the english nation old edwards had now recovered his powers of speech and working the gag out of his mouth rose up to shout treason murder and so forth this was heard by those above who had been welcoming young edwards unexpected return all were now active and young edwards assisted by some warders gave chase to the rapidly retreating regalia the blood contingent had already reached the byward tower and were making for the outer gateway when some of the king's jewels were dropped in order to lighten the burdens of those who ran but the colonel still hugged the crown they were soon out on tower wharf and making for st catherine's gate where the northern end of tower bridge now stands here horses awaited them and here they were aware that shouts of stop the rogues were proceeding from an excited body of men rushing towards them from the western end of the wharf the gallant colonel did not resign the crown without a struggle during which several of the jewels including the great pearl and a large diamond with which it was set rolled out upon the ground and were for a time lost but subsequently recovered parrot was found with portions of royal sceptre in various linings and pockets and a valuable ruby had been successfully conjured away when blood and his three tragic comedians had been made prisoners young edwards hastened back into the tower and acquainted sir gilbert talbot with the alarming news sir gilbert stamped and swore a round oath or two and hurried to the king to give him an account of the escapade charles commanded the prisoners to be brought before him at whitehall and the merry monarch endowed blood with a pension of five hundred pounds a year the second charles evidently admired a man of daring the seven bishops were confined huddled together would be the more literal term in the martin tower during the troublous days of james the second for refusing to subscribe to the declaration of indulgence a warrant was issued for their committal to the tower we are told by dr luckock in his bishops in the tower and the spectacle of the eighth of june sixteen eighty eight has had no parallel in the annals of history it has often been painted and in vivid colours but no adequate description can ever be given of a scene that was unique as the barge containing the bishops was pushed off from whitehall steps men and women rushed into the water and the people ran along the banks cheering with the wildest enthusiasm and crying god bless the bishops when they reached the traitor's gate and passed into the tower the soldiers on guard officers as well as men fell on their knees and begged for a blessing it was evening when they arrived and they asked for permission to attend the service in the chapel of st peter and the lesson for the day by a happy coincidence was one well calculated to inspire them with courage in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of god in such patience in afflictions in necessities in distresses in strifes in imprisonments the enthusiasm was continued long after the ponderous gates of the tower had closed upon them the soldiers of the garrison drank to the health of the bishops at their mess and nothing could stop them from such a manifestation of their sympathy the bishops were in the martin tower until june fifteen when they returned by water from the wharf and were taken to the court of king's bench they were tried on june twenty nine when sir robert langley foreman of the jury declared that the prisoners were found not guilty the scene again became one of the wildest joy and excitement the released bishops hearing the bells of a neighbouring church 
escaped from the crowd to join in the service and by a second coincidence more striking even than the first the lesson that day heard was the story of st peter's miraculous deliverance from prison the constable broad arrow and salt towers these small towers stand on the line of the eastern wall of the inner ward and face the tower bridge roadway in the first named the constable of the tower lived in henry the eighth's reign in the time of charles the first it was used as a prison its rooms and dungeons resemble those of the beecham tower but are on a smaller scale the broad arrow tower never lacked prisoners during the reigns of mary and elizabeth and the room on the first floor has some inscriptions left by captives these writings on the stone have been so frequently covered with whitewash that they are now somewhat difficult to decipher in eighteen thirty a list of the inscriptions was made and we find in it the following names and dates john daniel fifteen fifty six a prisoner concerned in a plot to rob the exchequer in mary's reign and hanged on tower hill thomas ford fifteen eighty two a priest executed for refusing to assent to the supremacy of queen elizabeth in the church john stoughton fifteen eighty six and j gage fifteen ninety one both priests at the top of this tower near the doorway giving access to the inner wall is a narrow cell with only a small aperture to admit light which rivals little ease in sparsity of accommodation behind the constable and broad arrow towers are the officers quarters of the garrison occupying ground on which stood until the reign of james the second an old building known as the king's private wardrobe connected with the now vanished royal palace southwest of the broad arrow tower lay the queen's garden the salt cradle and lanthorn towers the salt tower standing at the southeast corner of the ballium wall is one of the oldest portions of all the buildings and dates back to the time of william rufus it possesses a spacious dungeon with vaulted ceiling a finely carved chimney-piece in one of the upper rooms and in a prison chamber the inscription of hugh draper fifteen sixty one the memento of a sixteenth-century magician is cut on the wall the salt and cradle towers were the scene of an escape of two prisoners in elizabeth's reign father gerard and john arden gerard had been put in the salt tower for the part he is said to have taken in an attempt on the queen's life when examined before a council which sat in the room in the king's house where guy fox was afterwards convicted he refused to give any information that might involve brother priests for this he was ordered to be tortured in the dungeon under the white tower in the accounts which he himself wrote of the proceedings we are told that he and his guards went in solemn procession the attendants preceding us with lighted candles because the place was underground and very dark especially about the entrance it was a place of immense extent and in it were ranged diverse sorts of racks and other instruments of torture some of these they displayed before me and told me i should have to taste them gerard was led to a great upright beam or pillar of wood in the centre of the torture chamber and there hung up by his hands which were placed in iron shackles attached to an iron rod fixed in the pillar the stool on which he had stood while he was being done was taken away from under his feet and the whole weight of his body was supported by his wrists clasped in the gauntlets as he was a tall stout man his sufferings must have been terrible indeed while he hung thus he was again questioned as to his associates in the plot but he refused to betray any one he has left on record his sensations as he hung against the pillar of torture i felt he says that all the blood in my body had run into my arms and begun to burst out at my finger ends this was a mistake but the arms swelled until the gauntlets were buried in the flesh after being thus suspended for an hour i fainted when i came to myself i found the executioners supporting me in their arms they had replaced the stool under his feet and poured vinegar down his throat but as soon as he recovered consciousness 
the stool was withdrawn and gerard allowed to remain hanging in agony for five hours longer during which he fainted eight or nine times for three days he was put to this torture on the pillar and sir william wad then lieutenant of the tower exasperated at the victim's fortitude exclaimed at last hang there till you rot and he was left hanging till his arms were paralyzed each evening the victim half dead with pain and scarce able to crawl was taken back to his cell in the salt tower a few days later gerard was again brought before the council and again refused to compromise others wad thereupon delivered him to the charge of the chief of the torturers a dread official indeed with the injunction you are to rack him twice a day until such time as he chooses to confess once more he was led down into the dungeon beneath the white tower and strapped up to the pillar as before his swollen arms and wrists being forced into the iron bands which could now scarce go round them still he refused to give the name of a single friend and wad saw the futility of torturing him to death gerard was locked up in the salt tower again and lay on the floor of his chamber with maimed arms wrists and hands terrible to look upon yet he remained firm and the pains of the body could not it seemed affect his spirit it happened that in the cradle tower standing to the southwest of the salt tower on the outer wall and close by the wharf another roman catholic prisoner john arden was kept in confinement gerard when sufficiently recovered to be able to walk about again obtained leave of his jailer to visit arden together they planned escape they wrote to friends in the city with orange juice which writing was invisible unless subjected to a certain treatment whereby it became legible gerard by the help of these friends secured a long piece of thick string with a leaden weight attached and with this came a written promise that upon a certain night a boat would lie beside the wharf just under the cradle tower on the evening of the day appointed gerard stayed longer than usual with arden but dreading lest at any moment he should be sent for and taken back to the salt tower but night came and he was still in the cradle tower looking out anxiously across the moat towards the riverside at last the boat approached and was moored opposite the tower from which arden threw his line and both prisoners saw with joy that the leaden weight had cleared the moat and fallen on the wharf it was picked up by the boatmen and a strong rope was fastened to the cord this rope arden hauled up into his cell and made it fast gerard then swarmed down the tightened rope to the wharf suffering acute pain owing to the condition of his arms and wrists it was five months after his torture before the sense of touch was restored to his hands arden followed and both got away safely to the steps beside london bridge where they were met by the friends who had cheered them in their captivity and were taken to a place of safety the cradle tower is seen best from the wharf this broad riverside embankment constructed by henry the third makes a delightful promenade it is reached from the level of the tower bridge approach by descending a flight of steps on the eastern side of the roadway and passing under the bridge by the archway at the guard-room when this arch is passed under on the immediate right beyond the trees is seen the galleyman or devilin tower and the well tower to the left of it the galleyman or galligman tower to give it the name under which it appears in a plan of fifteen ninety seven was in former times a powder store and gave access to the iron gate now demolished it will be noticed that five towers stand closely together at this corner of the defences the southeastern portion of the fortress had always been considered that most exposed to attack the protecting ditch too is narrower at this point than elsewhere hence the need for additional fortification beside the cradle tower a modern drawbridge has been constructed giving access for stores within the outer and inner walls here lay the privy garden one of the most peaceful and secluded nooks in the fortress a place of old-world flowers and southern sunshine 
the cradle tower is so named from the existence there in former times of a cradle or movable bed by means of which boats could be hoisted from the moat and within the grated doorway in the tower wall raised on to a dry platform there the principal entrance to the outer ward lay in early days through this gateway in the cradle tower and prisoners were landed here as well as through traitor's gate in sixteen forty one it was described as a cradle tower a prison lodging the round lantern tower rising above and dwarfing the cradle tower was in tudor days known as the new tower and commanded the king's bedchamber and the queen's gallery towards the end of the eighteenth century this tower was burnt down and the walls from the lower portions and vaults were rebuilt in henry the third's reign this tower was a place of great importance its chambers were hung with ornate tapestry and the inner walls decorated with frescoes this tower being attached to the royal apartments was never used as a prison and so may be said to be happy in having no history of suffering attached to it it has been so admirably restored by salvin and again by taylor in eighteen eighty two that it has lost little of its original appearance from the wharf the massive st thomas tower can be examined more closely and the outer side of the traitor's gate is open to view the guns on the wharf near the byward tower are those that are used for the firing of salutes on days of royal anniversary End of chapter four Chapter Five of *The Tower of London* by Arthur Poyser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five, Tower Hill. The garlands wither on your brow, then boast no more your mighty deeds. Upon death's purple altar now, see where the victor victim bleeds. Your heads must come to the cold tomb. Only the actions of the just smell sweet and blossom in their dust j shirley the actual spot on which the scaffold was erected on the hill is marked in the garden by which it is now surrounded by a square of stone paving set in the turf just within the gate on the southwestern side of the enclosure happy children skip and play on this blood-stained bit of ground the flowers leap up in april and the birds make melody in may nature has healed the sore and done lavishly to make us forget by her gifts that here was the scene of angry mobs crying for the slaughter of some of the nation's noblest men the block was set up on a high wooden platform so that the ceremony of decapitation was performed well above the heads of the dense crowd that gathered on the hill when the more notable tower prisoners were brought here to die it is stated that during the making of the tunnel that goes through tower hill to-day the wooden foundations of the scaffold were discovered and also near by the remains of two victims whose bodies had been interred there neither the embedded timber nor the human bones were disturbed and both still lie beneath the turf to fix accurately the spot of execution tower hill seems to have possessed a gallows also for we find frequent record of criminals being hanged in chains there either for state or other offences under an oak tree that grew on the slope towards the tower gateway the public stock stood and in the vestry minutes of all hallows barking under the date december sixteenth sixteen fifty seven we find it recorded that an order was given for the erection of stocks and whipping post required by the statute at the churchyard corner in tower street against mr lowe's the drapers with a convenient shed over them how mr lowe the draper took the proposition we are not informed but if he expressed his feelings in forcible language he might perchance have met the fate of his neighbour mr holland who three years previously on april twenty sixth sixteen fifty four was fined three shillings fourpence by alderman tishborne for vain oaths sworn within the parish of all hallows tower hill would seem in those days to have had a peculiar attraction for beggars and common vagrants it was a popular resort for those who lived to beg and those who begged to live 
two very different classes of people but both equally inconvenient in the middle seventeenth century the condition of affairs became serious and gave alarm both to officials and to the annoyed inhabitants of the district in may sixteen forty seven the vestry of all hallows takes into consideration the destitute condition of the poor and it is ordered that a collection for the poor shall be made every second sabbath in the month the church wardens shall stand at the door to receive the free will offerings of the parishioners and in sixteen fifty four the residents appeal to the lord mayor for great great very great are your petitioners wants and may it please your honour to afford them some relief without which they are unable to maintain so great a charge hither came a poor starving frenchman who was solaced with two shillings a like sum was granted to a poor spaniard turned protestant and a poor dutch minister the dwellers on the side of tower hill were themselves at times reprimanded by the authorities for we find that in may sixteen fifty three goodman dawson and his wife are summoned to appear because they would not let their daughter aged seventeen go out to service their pension to be stopped as long as they encourage such indolence which seems a just enough proceeding this district suffered severely during the three years after the great fire tower hill lay on the eastern edge of the city of desolation the poor proprietor of the bluebell tavern which stood in picturesque angularities overlooking the hill before the catastrophe which reduced it to quote its owner's words to nothing but a ruinous heap of rubbish sought exemption in the sixteen sixty nine from arrears of lawful dues these old inns bordering tower hill were the scene of frequent parish dinners at which the consumption of food was so considerable as to lead one to believe that tower hill was noted in those days as it is to-day for its fresh air which sharpens the edge of appetite these feeds were partaken of by just as many men of import in the parish as could get into a small room mine host's best parlour on april twenty sixth sixteen twenty nine they consumed five stone of beef two legs of mutton two quarters of lamb three capons and so on a few weeks afterwards they were at it again and dine upon five ribs of beef a side of lamb two legs of mutton two capons and did drink wine and beer to the value of one pound seven shillings this reminds one of falstaff's feeds in eastcheap and his capacity for imbibing canary sack at one meal in henry the fourth shakespeare makes the fat knight if we go by the bill presented afterwards drink sixteen pints of wine in sixteen thirty two sack was sold in the city at nine pence per quart claret at five pence and malmsey and muscadine at eight pence in queen anne's reign tower hill is described as an open and spacious place set with trees extending round the west and north parts of the tower where there are many good new buildings mostly inhabited by gentry and merchants in the contemporary drawings it is shown as an open space but singularly devoid of trees the artists may have been so intent upon crowding their pictures with tightly packed citizens gazing upon the decapitation of some unfortunate nobleman that they forgot to put in the trees certainly several of the fine trees that now adorn trinity square are of some age and represent the survivors of that fragment of the ancient forest which crept up to the eastern side of the hill and which we see so plainly marked in many of the old maps in a house on the western side of tower hill lady raleigh dwelt with her son when her husband was denied her society from her window she could look out day by day upon the brick tower to which raleigh had been removed and tradition asserts that she was able to communicate with him and send him gifts in spite of wad's stringent orders the house in which william penn was born on october fourteenth sixteen forty four stood on the east side of the hill its site is covered by the new roadway leading to the minories penn was sent to school at chigwell in essex and it was during those days of boyhood that he had been impressed by the preaching of a quaker preacher which led him to forsake the church of his baptism 
he was baptized as we shall see in the following chapter in all hallows barking and join the society of friends thomas otway the poet abused by rochester in his session of the poets and praised by dryden died it is believed of starvation in the bull inn on tower hill when only thirty-four years old that great elizabethan edmund spencer was born near tower hill in fifteen fifty two and passed his boyhood there before going when sixteen to pembroke college cambridge in little tower street in a timber fronted many gabled house now alas swept away james thompson wrote his poem summer published in seventeen twenty seven so much for literary associations peter the great who raised russia out of the slough of ignorance and obscurity in order to superintend the building of a navy took upon himself the task of learning shipbuilding first as a common labourer afterwards as a master craftsman he came to london for four months and worked in the dockyards by day and drank heavily in a public-house at all hallows barking parish at night he was accustomed to resort to an inn in great tower street and smoke and drink ale and brandy almost enough to float the vessel he had been helping to construct barrow his biographer states that the landlord had the czar of muscovy's head painted and put up for his sign which continued until the year eighteen o eight when a person of the name of waxel took a fancy to the old sign and offered the then occupier of the house to paint him a new one for it a copy was accordingly made from the original which maintains its station to the present day as the sign of the czar's head the house has since been rebuilt and the sign removed but the name remains while the earl of rochester was in disgrace at court in charles the second's time he is said to have robed and bearded himself as an italian quack or mountebank physician and under the name of bendo set up at a goldsmith's house next door to the black swan in tower street where he advertised that he was to be seen from three of the clock in the afternoon till eight at night the second duke of buckingham came once or twice in disguise in his days of political intrigue to a house facing tower hill to consult an old astrologer who professed to draw horoscopes in seething lane then known as sidden lane which runs from all hallows barking to the church of st olaf's hart street sir francis walsingham queen elizabeth's principal secretary dwelt in a fair and large house this foe of the jesuits died here on april five fifteen ninety and was buried next night at ten of the clock in paul's church st olaf's church is a building with many interesting associations and a well-written little pamphlet has recently been issued which visitors will do well to read there is only space here to mention that pepys monument in the south aisle where the diarist was buried in june seventeen o three the service being taken by his friend dr hicks vicar of all hallows barking the registers of the parish show that from july four to december five sixteen sixty five there were buried three hundred and twenty six people who had died of the plague a quaint skull and crossbones carving can still be seen over the gateway within which the burial pit lay pepys going to church reluctantly early in the following year is relieved to find snow covering the plague spot st olaf's has renewed its old-time activity under the care of its present rector the rev a b boyd carpenter there is much of interest also in the neighbouring church of st dunstan in the east lying between tower street and lower thames street its graceful spire is a familiar landmark and with its flying buttresses set in bold relief when seen from tower hill against a sunset sky makes a noble crown to the church hidden from sight st dunstan's list of rectors dates back to the early fourteenth century in eighteen ten the church became ruinous and the walls of the nave owing to insecurity of foundations showed signs of collapsing altogether the present building was opened in eighteen twenty one after restoration and reconstruction the registers of st dunstan's escaped the fire and date back to fifteen fifty eight 
a valuable model of the church as rebuilt by wren and almost contemporaneous with the rebuilding may be seen in the vestry the chief mint of england was from the conquest down to eighteen eleven situated within tower walls it was removed in the year just mentioned to the present buildings on the eastern side of little tower hill over which visitors are shown if application be made beforehand to the deputy master the art of making money is here shown from the solid bar of gold to the new sovereign washed and tested sent out on its adventurous career in a world which will welcome its face in whatever company it appears the mint also possesses an excellently arranged museum of coins and medals in which are many invaluable treasures trinity house headquarters of the trinity brethren stands on tower hill facing the tower a graceful and well-proportioned building it supplants the older quarters in water lane great tower street the corporation of trinity house was established in fifteen twenty nine as the masters wardens and assistants of the guild or fraternity or brotherhood of the most glorious and undividable trinity and the first headquarters was situated near the river at deptford the guild was founded by sir thomas spurt comptroller of the navy to henry the eighth and commander of the great ship a huge gilt foremaster the hairy grace de dieu in which the king sailed to calais on his way to the field of the cloth of gold in eighteen fifty four the exclusive right of lighting and buoying the coast was given to the board of trinity house within trinity house to-day may be seen models of practically all the important lighthouses and lightships on the english coast the regulations of trinity house in former times are described by strype and among them we find rules to the effect that bumboats with fruit wine and strong waters were not permitted by them to board vessels every mariner who swore cursed or blasphemed on board ship was to pay one shilling to the ship's poor box every mariner found drunk was fined one shilling and no mariner could absent himself from prayers unless sick without forfeiting sixpence the present house on tower hill was built in seventeen ninety three ninety five by william wyatt on the front ionic in character are sculptured the arms of the corporation medallions of george the third and queen charlotte genie with nautical instruments and representations of four of the principal lighthouses on the coast the interior is beautified by several valuable pictures one of them a large gainsborough and a suite of most handsome furniture here too is preserved a flag taken from the spanish armada by drake and many curious old maps and charts the present master of trinity house is his royal highness the prince of wales who visits tower hill every trinity monday and with the elder brethren walks through trinity square and catherine court to service at the parish church an old print hanging in one of the rooms of trinity house depicts with some realism the last execution on tower hill in seventeen forty seven when lord lovett suffered in august of the previous year the earl of kilmarnock and lord balmerino had been brought to the block after the culloden tragedy a journal of the time gives us a most detailed account of the proceedings from which some extracts may be taken in order to form some idea of procedures that were soon to end for ever about eight o'clock the sheriffs of london and the executioner met at the mitre tavern in friendchurch street where they breakfast and went from thence to the house on tower hill near catherine's court now catherine house hired by them for the reception of the lords before they should be conducted to the scaffold which was erected about thirty yards from the said house at ten o'clock the block was fixed on the stage and covered with black cloth with several sacks of straw-dust up to strew on it soon after the coffins were brought also covered with black cloth the leaden plates from the lids of these coffins are those now preserved on the west wall of st peter's on tower green at a quarter after ten the account proceeds the sheriffs went in procession to the outward gate of the tower and after knocking at it some time 
a warder within asked who's there the officer without replied the sheriffs of london and middlesex the warder then asked what do they want the officer answered the bodies of william earl of kilmarnock and arthur lord balmerino upon which the warder within said i will go and inform the lieutenant of the tower and in about ten minutes the lieutenant with the earl of kilmarnock and major white with lord balmerino guarded by several of the warders came to the gate the prisoners were then delivered to the sheriffs who gave proper receipt for their bodies to the lieutenant who as usual said god bless king george to which the earl of kilmarnock assented by a bow and the lord balmerino said god bless king james lord kilmarnock had met lord balmerino at the foot of the stairs in the tower and said to him my lord i am heartily sorry to have your company in this expedition the prisoners were led to the house near the block in trinity square and they spent what time was left to them in devotions kilmarnock was brought out to the scaffold first the executioner who before had something administered to keep him from fainting was so affected by his lordship's distress and the awfulness of the scene that on asking his lord kilmarnock's forgiveness he burst into tears my lord bade him take courage giving him at the same time a purse with five guineas and telling him he would drop his handkerchief as a signal for the stroke in the meantime when all things were ready for the execution and the black baize which hung over the rails of the scaffold having by the direction of the colonel of the guard or the sheriffs been turned up that the people might see all that the circumstances of the execution in about two minutes after he kneeled down his lordship dropped his handkerchief the executioner at once severed the head from the body except only a small portion of the skin which was immediately divided by a gentle stroke the head was received in a piece of red baize and with the body immediately put into the coffin lord balmerino followed shortly afterwards wearing the uniform in which he had fought at culloden his end was not so swift as lord kilmarnock's had been twice the executioner bungled his stroke and not until the third blow was the head severed lord lovett whom hogarth had seen and painted in the white hart inn at st albans as the prisoner was being brought to london was led to the block on tower hill on thursday april ninth seventeen forty seven and his was the last blood that was shed there just before his execution a scaffolding which had been erected at the eastern end of barking alley fell and brought to the ground a thousand spectators who had secured places upon it to view the execution twelve were killed outright and scores of others injured lovett as the account puts it in spite of his awful situation seemed to enjoy the downfall of so many whigs lord lovett's head was at one blow severed from his body and tower hill's record of bloodshed was at an end end of chapter five chapter six of the tower of london by arthur poyser this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six all hallows barking by the tower part one calm soul of all things make it mine to feel amid the city's jar that there abides a peace of thine man did not make and cannot mar matthew arnold on the southwest side of tower hill there stands the oldest parish church in london but beyond the earliest date that we find any portion of the present building mentioned it is more than probable that a still more ancient church occupied this piece of ground consider the importance of the site the approach to london from the sea was then as now a somewhat dreary progress between the mud flats that fringe the river on the northern bank the rising ground now known as tower hill would be the first relief to the eye after the wearying essex marshes beyond and behind that hill lay the little city and beside that hill was set a church but with the building of the white tower the church was eclipsed as a landmark for boats on the river 
and now it is quite obscured from the waterside by hideous brick warehouses that only men of the nineteenth century could conceive and erect in early days this church stood on the edge of london now it is in its very centre yet few buildings equally well preserved have altered as little as this old building has this fair church on tower hill and we have here handed down to us much that is unique as a record not only of english history but of the progress of architecture the furnishings of the church the carvings and wrought ironwork also carry us through generations of activity in such arts and the pavement brasses and sculptured tombs serve as memorials of many a famous englishman the church has an additional interest in being the nearest ancient building outside the tower walls and in having received for burial victims from the block on tower hill yet the close connection of this ancient church with the tower and its history has not hitherto been sufficiently emphasized it is well therefore that we should give all hallows some of our time when we have explored and examined the tower itself four hundred years before the conqueror laid the foundation stones of the white tower a cluster of cottages on the edge of tower hill and lying not far from the old gate of the old walls of london constituted the germ of the present parish and stood within sight of the earlier church what the history of the church was then we have no means of knowing but as it would be the first building of importance that danish invaders came upon during their onslaughts on london it must have passed through exciting times in those old days of raid and turmoil erkenwald a seventh century bishop of london founded the convent at barking in essex of this convent his sister st ethelburga became first abbess and the abbesses of barking were not only mitred but were in after days peeresses of the realm erkenwald made over certain rights of the land upon which the parish is now spread to this convent of barking and in return a priest was supplied from the community to serve the religious needs of the parishioners it was thus the surname barking was acquired it is however a surname that is somewhat misleading as printers even to this present day have an awkward habit of placing a comma between all hallows and barking and so send many who would visit the church on an empty quest into essex but the poor printer is not altogether to blame the people here have a way of calling themselves barking people and of referring to the parish as barking parish this leads to unnecessary confusion the only alternative would be to retain the term on tower hill and ask the good folks of the essex town to adopt some other name as it is improbable that either of these suggestions will be taken seriously a return to the ancient title Birking church by the tower might solve the difficulty the parish system in england took its rise under theodore archbishop of canterbury a d six six eight and the number and boundaries of the parishes as we know them to-day agree very nearly with the parochial divisions in doomsday book the ground now included in all hallows parish was undoubtedly included in roman london which extended from tower hill to dowgate hill the present fenchurch and lombard streets forming the line of its northern boundary eastward of the parish lay marsh and forest the great forest of essex of which so wide and unspoilt a portion remains to us in epping forest in ten eighty seven when a great fire devastated the city a church in the norman style took the place of the saxon building and the nave pillars of all hallows date from that time of these pillars the one that shows its great age more than the others which after successive cleanings look almost new is that westernmost pillar on the north side which stands within the choir practice room to this norman building richard i added either where the chancel portion of the north aisle now stands or near at hand a chantry chapel known as capella beata maria de barkings juxta turum this was for some time the most famous shrine in connection with the building and became the care of the kings of england 
in this chantry was placed by edward i a statue of the virgin in accordance with a command received by him in a vision before his father's death in which he was assured that he should subdue wales and scotland and would be victorious while this barking's chapel was kept in repair tradition asserts that the heart of the lion-hearted richard was placed under the altar of the chapel here but others maintain that after its removal from fontevraud where the king was buried it was sent to rouen yet in the time of the first edward an indulgence of forty days was obtained for all penitents worshipping at the shrine of the virgin at barking's chapel and in that instrument prayer is especially asked for the soul of the founder richard i whose heart is buried beneath the high altar a little later in the history of the church and its chapels we come upon the name of john tiptoff and sir john croke both of whom famous in their generations took a special interest in all hallows the former was brought into touch with the place upon his appointment as constable of the tower he was created earl of worcester by henry the sixth was the friend and supporter of caxton and has been called the nursing father of english printing a man of great learning he had studied under guarino at ferrara had occupied a professor's chair at padua was termed by walpole one of the noble authors of england is remembered as a good but ruthless soldier lawyer and politician and was in the end by the influence of warwick the kingmaker disgraced and beheaded on tower hill Tiptoff founded a confraternity or guild at Barking Chapel, and of this guild elected Sir John Croke to be one of the first wardens. Of Tiptoff, who was buried at Blackfriars Monastery, no memorial remains here, but Croke's tomb we shall come upon later as we go through the church. In the time of Richard III, the Chantry Chapel comes once again into the light of fame and is known far and wide as Barkingshaw richard who as we have seen was no saint when dwelling in the tower seems to have been influenced by the age and sanctity of all hallows to do good deeds and is known here only as pious benefactor he achieved this by new building this chapel and adding to the original foundation a college of priests consisting of a dean calderton a friend of richard's and six canons in the calendar of state papers domestic henry the eighth tenth july fifteen fourteen there is to be found a record of a confirmation of the chapel of st mary in the cemetery of barking church london to the guild of st mary provision is also made for the election of a master and four wardens annually for the safe custody of the said chapel if barking chapel during its long history had been the peculiar care of royalty the church after the upheavals in the time of henry the eighth and edward the sixth became the care and also the resort of the prosperous burgesses of the city it was conveniently near the tower where the king and his court were lodged and where the king's justiciars held their sittings and so became a meeting-place of representative citizens where matters could be discussed when the city and tower happened to be at variance not by any means an infrequent occurrence from early times indeed we may trace the feelings of affection which dwellers in the city and more especially in the parish have felt for their historic church in twelve sixty five we hear of sir roger de Liborn, who was lodging in the tower meeting the representatives of the city at barking church on their proposing to make their submission to the king after the battle of evesham to that meeting came the mayor and a countless multitude of citizens again in twelve eighty the burgesses apparelled in their best attire gathered at barking church and proceeded to the tower to meet the king's justiciars for the purpose of holding an inquest or inquiring into the peace of the city gregory the mayor as we read in the liber albus of the corporation of london disputing the right of the crown to hold an inquest for the city of london for the honour of the mayoralty refused to enter the tower as mayor but laying aside his insignia and seal at the high altar of barking church as the last church in the city next the tower entered the tower merely as one of the aldermen 
alleging that by the ancient liberties he was not bound to attend the inquest nor to make appearance therein for judgments unless forewarned for forty days the king edward i as punishment for this disobedience abolished the office of mayor appointing a warden in his place which custom obtained till twenty six ed one when the ancient liberties of the city were restored those of the citizens who had accompanied rokesley to barking church were confined in the tower for some days and would no doubt on their return to their admiring families be looked upon with certain awe ever afterwards in the archives of the guildhall we find that in thirteen o two all hallows barking appears as one of the advowsons of the city of london belonging to the abbess and convent of barking but after the suppression of the convent by henry the eighth the patronage passed to the archbishop of canterbury in whose hands it remains to this day another interesting fact we gather from the ancient records of the city is that all hallows was one of the three churches where the curfew was rung each night as a warning that it was time for all good citizens to be indoors and as a precaution against fire this ancient curfew bell it is believed is that hung in the small bell turret on the tower of the church and upon which the hammer of the clock strikes the hours towards the end of the fifteenth century great changes took place with regard to the structure of the church the chantry chapels had fallen into a state of disrepair and it became necessary to rebuild the chancel to which they were attached and to strengthen the fabric of the nave it is to this rebuilding that we owe the contrast afforded by the massive pillars of the body of the church with the graceful deeply moulded perpendicular pillars of the chancel the manner in which the one style has been grafted on the other where as allen says the pillars between the chancel and the nave are singularly composed of half a circle and half a clustered column worked together attracts the attention of even the most casual observer mr fleming in his admirable little pamphlet on the church sums up the various alterations that have taken place in the structure when he says the view of the stately interior tells at once and more fully than the outside features the story of the changes that have befallen the church through the centuries since its foundation for the columns of the nave are norman the east window with its intricate tracery was the work of the sumptuous decorated period whilst the clerestory and aisles with the slender clustered shafts of the chancel arcading belong to the perpendicular style all hallows is a good instance of the manner in which entirely convinced of the supreme merits of their school of building the architects of the perpendicular period superimposed their style on what had gone before the contrast between the light clustered columns of the chancel with their beautiful splayed arches and the heavy pillars of the nave is extremely striking and almost remorseless in its hint of the supercilious ease with which the men of the tudor period parted from the past and its traditions the interior of the church was at this time embellished by mural decorations and lingering traces of the paint on one or two of the nave columns were left undisturbed during the last restoration in nineteen o four a rude screen stood in front of the new chancel and above it rose the famous dunnington organ alas no traces of either remain to us even in a museum while charles i was on the throne the interior was again renovated and during the long toll of subsequent years the history of all hallows resolves itself into a record of successive restorations few churches have been more carefully and lovingly tended than this has been and its present state of preservation is due to this interest which it has always inspired in those who appreciate its worth and beauty all hallows unlike so many other churches has not lost but gained by its restorations an old building such as this is in constant need of attention the problem has ever been the vexed one of renewing without destroying but any one who enters all hallows to-day will feel that the problem has been solved here with complete success the later restorations including the re-roofing restoration of the ancient battlements and preservation of the lower parts of the outer walls 
has cost in round figures twelve thousand pounds and every penny has been wisely spent in handing down to future generations so wonderful a memorial of the past the period of the commonwealth has left its mark in most sacred buildings as a time of pulling down but this church has the singular advantage of remembering it as a time of setting up the old stone tower which stood at the southwest corner of the building the foundations of which were uncovered a few years ago during the erection of that amazing indiscretion the warehouse which now stands upon the site was severely disturbed in sixteen forty nine when on january four of that year a blow of twenty-seven barrels of gunpowder that took fire in a ship chandler's house on the south side of the church created havoc in the immediate neighbourhood the explosion is described in strype's edition of stowe's survey it seems that the chandler was busy in his shop barrelling the powder about seven o'clock in the evening when it became ignited and blew up not merely that house but fifty or sixty others the number of persons destroyed was never ascertained for the next house but one was a tavern known as the rose which was full of company in consequence of a parish dinner it must have been very great however judging from the number of limbs and bodies which were dug up from the ruins the hostess of the tavern sitting in the bar and the waiter standing by with a tankard in his hand were found beneath some fallen beams but were dead from suffocation it is recorded that the morning after this disaster a female infant was discovered lying in a cradle on the roof of the church neither bruised nor singed the parents of the babe were never traced the child was given the surname barking adopted by the parish and lived to an adult age but while the baby was saved the heavy tower was doomed as a result of the shock it became so insecure that complete demolition was necessary during the protectorate the present tower was set up and though it is about as uninspired a piece of ecclesiastical brickwork as one can imagine yet it has a certain interest not only for having arisen during the days of cromwell but for having just barely escaped destruction when the great fire came to its base it was up this tower that the ever curious peeps who lived near by in seething lane climbed hurriedly to see the devastation of old london the event will be found recorded in the diary under the date of september five sixteen sixty six the building of this tower brings to mind an amusing episode in the records of the church it appears that over the clock the dial of the barking church mentioned by pepys the wardens then in office put up a huge effigy of st michael weighing nearly twenty tons its right hand held a trumpet and in its left was a leaden scroll inscribed arise ye dead and come to judgment st michael having been scorched and blistered by the fire of london was taken down in sixteen seventy five there was no hustling in those days repainted and placed over the commandments at the east end of the church two smaller figures which had supported the central effigy on the wall of the tower were put up over the organ in the new organ loft at the west end where reclining gracefully they remain to this day st michael had a rougher time of it and was the cause of one of those absurd squabbles that too often mar the harmony of a quiet parish one or two of the congregation indicted the church wardens at old bailey under the statute of edward the sixth against images but the prosecution was abandoned on the ground of expense a mr shearman supported the parishioners and upon his own responsibility destroyed the image this occasioned a furious war of words between him and the lecturer jonathan saunders acting as curate of the parish shearman wrote virulent pamphlets which were published by a friend of the authors to prevent false reports and addressed them to the vicar dr hicks and his wardens the latter part of this entertaining publication asserts as a dig at saunders as compared with the vicar that the men of the least learning are always the most formal it goes on to insinuate that barking parish was then as famous for its love of drinking ceremonies as for its dislike of religious formality the drinking ceremonies have certainly passed away the pamphlet concludes thus 
i hope our parish shall not lose an inch of its reputation nor be censured as irregular but remain a primitive pattern for all london yea and all england mr saunders replied with double-shotted guns and the shearman battery opened fire again with unfailing vigour the parishioners soon tired of the troublesome and cantankerous shearman and all his ways his statements were considered rude scurrilous and scandalous and it was recorded in the minutes of the vestry held on april twenty four sixteen eighty one that his attack tends to the dishonour of the church of england as now established and is a libel upon the vicar and the whole parish so ends this seventeenth century turmoil before we enter the church by the north porch our attention will be attracted by the three carved figures above the doorway that in the centre represents the virgin the church being dedicated to st mary and all saints with st ethelburga abbess of barking on one side and bishop andrews who was baptized in all hallows on the other this group as has been well said combines in one presentment three periods in the history of the church the primitive the medieval and the modern inside the porch the quaint chambers on the left are restorations of what in earlier times were it is conjectured recesses for meditation and study in front of us is the second doorway delicately carved and much weather worn owing to exposure of the soft stone before the building of the porch the first glance we have of the interior of the church from just within this doorway must impress us with a sense of the dignity of the building north aisle as we turn to go down the north aisle we will see set in the pavement a plain square brass above the grave of george snaith auditor to archbishop laud who was buried here to be near his master in sixteen fifty one the church is singularly rich in pavement brasses and before the removals and mutilations of puritan times possessed an even more remarkable collection of these memorials at the eastern end of the aisle we come upon the curious stone commemorating thomas burby seventh vicar this is the only tomb of a pre-reformation vicar that remains in the building though the slab is worn almost smooth by the feet of so many generations yet the outlines of an elaborate design can still be traced upon it a rubbing taken recently showed a full-length figure with a dog lying at the feet to the left the fragment of brass towards the top of the stone bore apparently an engraving of the head and of the hands raised to the chin in an attitude of prayer virby was a remarkable man in a fifteenth-century english chronicle edited for the camden society in eighteen fifty six it appears that in the nineteenth year of king harry the friday before midsummer a priest called sir rick Reich, a vicar in essex was burnt on tower hill for heresy for whose death was a great murmuring and many simple people came to the place making their prayers as to a saint and to bear away the ashes of his body for relics some were taken to prison in the tower amongst others the vicary of barking church beside the tower in whose parish all this was done virby was charged with scattering powder and spices over the place where the heretic was burnt that it might be believed that this sweet flavour came of the ashes of the dead but evidently this was considered no very great offence for virby was subsequently set free restored to his position at all hallows and died vicar in fourteen fifty three nearer the altar steps will be found the beautifully engraved brass in the french style of john bacon who died in fourteen thirty seven a heart inscribed with the word mercy and encircled by a scroll lies in the upper part of the stone and the figures of bacon and his wife cut out of latin or sheet brass and two feet one inch in length occupy the sides the treatment of the drapery of both figures is quite perfect giving too an excellent idea of the costume of the time the scroll bears the words mater dei momento mei jesu fili dei miserere mei bacon belonged to the ancient company of woolmen which seems to have been the leading guild of the middle ages its members were usually adventurous and wealthy men 
brasses dedicated to men of this craft are very numerous and this need excite no surprise when we remember how much of their trade was continental and particularly carried on in those countries where latin was milled bacon we may surmise from his will preserved at the guildhall was a man of substance and of many acres near by will be seen an incised slab over the tomb of the wife of william denham alderman sheriff and master of the ironworkers company who departed this life on wednesday at five of the clock at afternoon easter week the last day of march a d fifteen forty the brass has disappeared the finely wrought canopied altar tomb against the north wall close by the bacon brass dates back to the fifteenth century it is carved in purbeck marble and at the back has two small brasses one representing a man with five sons and the other a woman with seven daughters all kneeling name and date are both gone but a shield in the left-hand corner enables us to connect the monument with the family of croke sir john croke it will be remembered was one of the early wardens of barking chapel a trustee to whom edward the fourth conveyed the lands for the support of the chapel of st mary and founder of a chantry here in fourteen seventy seven this john croke citizen leather seller and alderman of london was a generous benefactor to all hallows leaving to it at his death many gifts and sundry legacies to the altar of all hallows barking the works of the church to purchase vestments and books for the repair of the roof loft and so on it is quite probable that this memorial was used as a chantry altar of which there were many in the church until fifteen forty seven and the beginning of the years of spoliation a well-carved crest will be seen on the pavement stone covering the marischal tomb and nearer the altar steps a grey marble slab of the year of the great fire lies over the grave of sir roger hatton alderman whose coat of arms may be traced near the head of the stone on the north wall we find a memorial to charles wathen the indulgent parent of nine children one of which master william received his death wound in battling with a pirate in the east indies and should therefore be somewhat of a hero to all boys in the adventure stage of their careers a broken pillar on this wall was put up in sixteen ninety six in memory of giles litcott the first controller general of the customs of england and the english colonies in america whose mother was the daughter of sir thomas overbury poisoned in the tower pepys in his account of the fire of sixteen sixty six refers to an alderman starling a very rich man without children the fire at the next door to him in our lane seething lane after our men had saved his house he did give two shillings sixpence amongst thirty of them and did quarrel with some that would remove the rubbish out of the way of the fire saying that they had come to steal this very rich man was lord mayor in sixteen seventy and his arms are depicted in stained glass in one of the windows in this aisle as a remembrance of the escape of the church from the great fire attached to the pillar behind the pulpit there remains an interesting relic in the form of an elegantly designed hat peg the only survivor of many such pegs on the pillars of this church dating back it is believed to the early seventeenth century above the croke altar tomb to the left there is to be seen the kneeling figure of jerome bonalia an italian probably the venetian ambassador who died in fifteen eighty three and in his will thus indicates his burial place volendo che il mio corpo sia sepultra nella parrocchia di barchen end of chapter six part one Chapter Six of *The Tower of London* by Arthur Poyser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six: All Hallows Barking by the Tower, Part Two. East End, the eighteenth-century monument that partially hides the windows at the east end of the north aisle, covers the tomb of Thomas Gordon of Tower Liberty, who, according to the inscription, had the singular felicity to command esteem confidence and affection in the tender and more delicate connections of private life 
but his is certainly the misfortune to be remembered by as ugly and depressing a memorial as could be imagined even in the year of its erection a vestry minute records that the monument now erecting for the late mr gordon is a nuisance in machen's diary fifteen fifty six it is stated that on the sixth day of september was buried at barking church mr philip dennis squire with coat of arms this dennis coat of arms may still be seen now somewhat time-worn on the wall between the gordon monument and the altar the beautiful and softly toned stained glass of the east window is modern the work of mr j clayton it commemorates the incumbency of dr mason the first head of the present college of clergy attached to this church the altarpiece beneath heavy in design and gloomy in effect is an example of the art of sixteen eighty six some elaborate carving is hidden beneath the coverings and frontal of the communion table it is an excellent example of the skilful workmanship in wood that has been to some extent neglected since the days of gibbons for many years the brass altar rails erected in seventeen fifty were so blackened by neglect that they were often mistaken for rails of old wood by their individual gracefulness when examined at close quarters and yet solid appearance when viewed from the nave these beautiful rails form one of the most striking adornments of the building clergy vestry permission to enter this room should be obtained from the sacristan who will show the many interesting documents treasured there on the wall to the right as one enters the room hangs an excellent painting of dr gaskarth twenty-seventh vicar who was appointed in sixteen eighty six a highly popular vicar generous and of firm but conciliatory manners under his auspices the church was twice thoroughly repaired he was vicar for forty-six years and died in seventeen thirty two aged eighty six those who have an interest in such matters are recommended to read the beautiful latin lines inscribed in the registers where under the date december one seventeen o three dr gaskarth records the burial of his wife on the wall to the left of the entrance there are two interesting old maps the lower one which is more of a picture than a map giving an excellent idea of the appearance of london before the fire and the small one higher on the wall a representation of all hallows standing almost alone on tower hill before the parish consisted of more than a few rows of cottages this is the valuable gascoigne survey made in fifteen ninety seven on the wall to the left of the fireplace will be found a key plan to all the tombs brasses and memorials of the church placed here through the instrumentality of the then church warden mr henry Orquart would that earlier church wardens had taken like interest in the place and left us such plans of the building in their day from the windows of the vestry there is to be had a glimpse of the graveyard somewhat depressing with its many ancient and fast decaying tomb monuments and headstones the registers of the church stored in an iron room opening off this vestry contains much that is of very great interest and time spent in their examination will not be lost there are thirteen books the first beginning in fifteen fifty eight with the accession of queen elizabeth and extending to sixteen fifty taking the baptisms first we are reminded that before the beginning of the records now remaining there was about the year fifteen fifty five the christening ceremony of the famous bishop andrews a native of this parish in the church as the bishop constantly prayed for all hallows barking where i was baptized this fact is beyond dispute though the actual entry is lost in sixteen o nine we come upon the name of francis son of sir james bourchier knight under february five bourchier was father-in-law of oliver cromwell and a city merchant of considerable importance he possessed an estate at felstead in essex and a town-house beside tower hill then a favourite residence of the lesser aristocracy in sixteen sixteen we find that a son of sir william apsley lieutenant of the tower was baptized here showing the close connection that has always existed between this church and the tower but the most interesting of all the entries is that against october twenty three sixteen forty four when william penn founder of pennsylvania was brought to the font at all hallows 
his father an officer of high rank in the navy at that time dwelt upon the east side of tower hill within a court adjoining to london walk and william his eldest son was born within that house now demolished within tower liberties it is worth while to note that it was not until quite late in the eighteenth century that double christian names were given to children brought to baptism with regard to marriages the register begins in fifteen sixty four and in sixteen fifty there is a curious entry under march twenty eighth which states that a couple being married went away and gave not their names in seventeen sixty three samuel parr father of the celebrated dr parr married margaret cox of this parish spinster this margaret was the daughter of dr cox formerly headmaster of harrow school another interesting entry is that referring to john quincy adams afterwards sixth president of the united states who was thirty years old when on july twenty sixth seventeen ninety seven he married louisa catherine johnson of this parish judge jeffreys also married his first wife here but the entry has disappeared the burial register is most remarkable of all in fifteen sixty three a plague year there were no less than two hundred and eighty four burials mostly women and children and nearly twenty two thousand people died in that year in london alone other periods of plague and consequent excessive mortality were the years fifteen eighty two fifteen ninety three sixteen twenty five and sixteen sixty five in sixteen twenty five three hundred and ninety four persons died in this parish being six times the average mortality the calendar of state papers for this year contains a record of a petition from the minister and churchwardens of all hallows barking praying that some part of the cloth for mourning for the late king distributed among the poor of diverse parishes of london may be given to this parish one of the poorest within the city walls and sorely visited by the plague the plague of sixteen sixty five most disastrous of a long series is too well known from sundry descriptions to need more than mere mention here before the earliest date in this book of burials there was placed in the graveyard of barking church the headless body very indecently interred of bishop fisher executed on the east smithfield side of tower hill in fifteen thirty five reference has already been made to fisher in connection with his imprisonment in the bell tower and the removal of his body after it had lain for some time in this churchyard to st peter's on tower green another victim of henry the eighth's wrath henry howard the poet earl of surrey was in fifteen forty seven buried beside the church after a mock trial and subsequent execution on tower hill his remains also were removed and taken in sixteen fourteen to framlingham in suffolk lord thomas gray brother of the duke of suffolk and uncle of lady jane gray was headed on a tower hill april twenty eighth fifteen fifty four and buried in all hallows barking in queen mary's luckless reign a plot to rob the queen's exchequer was discovered and the leaders sent to the tower Mockin's diary thus records the event on the eighth day of july henry peckham and john daniel were hanged on tower hill their bodies were cut down and headed the heads carried to london bridge and the bodies buried in barkin church continuing our inspection of the burial register we come upon the most interesting entry of all under the date january eleventh sixteen forty four we read william laud archbishop of canterbury beheaded the last word has been almost erased we can but conjecture that the word was traitor and that some later hand scratched out all but the initial letter but why was that letter left if every trace of so hateful a word was to be obliterated laud was buried in the vicar's vault under the altar but his body was taken to st john's college oxford in sixteen sixty three 
laud's body being accompanied to the grave with great multitudes of people who in love or curiosity or remorse of conscience had gathered together was decently interred in all hallows barking and had the honour of being buried in that church in the form provided by the common prayer-book after it had been long disused and almost reprobated in most of the churches in london some earlier entries in this register are of sufficient interest to attract attention during fifteen sixty there is a curious reference to the burial of a poor starved callous man which may mean a callousman a beggar or a destitute refugee from calais which had been lost to england two years earlier in fifteen ninety one fifteen ninety six and fifteen ninety nine there were buried in the church two sons and a daughter of the famous robert earl of essex favourite of elizabeth which earl possessed a house in seething lane in this parish entries regarding persons of less fame but surely of considerable interest to us as suggesting the state of the poor at that time occur in the seventeenth century one is a poor soldier dying in the streets in the night whose name was unknown february eighteen sixteen o six another is a poor boy that died in the streets sixteen twenty and yet another is one unknown starved on tower hill january fifteen sixteen twenty seven with the entries for january one and two sixteen forty four we are introduced to the period of the civil war during which time tower hill was the scene of frequent executions and all hallows barking received the headless bodies of many of the victims against the dates just mentioned there are the names of john hotham esq beheaded for betraying his trust to the state and sir john hotham knight beheaded for betraying his trust to the parliament sir john hotham and his son were beheaded in consequence of a design to deliver up hull to the king which place they held for the parliamentary forces with these melancholy entries we may place another of the seventeenth day of the following june which records the burial of dorothy a daughter of sir john hotham knight and the lady elizabeth his wife and tells of the passing away of the grief-stricken child who desired to be buried here with her father on april twenty three sixteen fifty the entry colonel andrews beheaded buried in the chancel refers to colonel eusebius andrews an old loyalist condemned to suffer as a traitor he was beheaded on tower hill dying with much firmness and courage on leaving the vestry we may notice behind the door leading into the church a recently discovered and much damaged piscina or place of ablution for the priest serving at the altar this was accidentally found when the walls were stripped of their plaster in nineteen o four from its position it would lead one to suppose that the altar rails were at one time carried along on the top of the present altar steps but of this we have no conclusive proof the best view of the interior of the church is to be obtained from this standpoint the high pitch of the excellently restored roof the grace and lightness of the chancel pillars as contrasted with the massiveness of those in the nave the imposing appearance of the handsome organ case all these striking features will leave one of the most lingering impressions of the building as a whole apart from its interest in detail with those who pause here as before a remarkable picture on the easternmost pillar of the chancel there will be noticed the memorial to john kettlewell the celebrated non-juror who died in sixteen ninety five and by his own desire was buried in the same grave where archbishop laud was before interred his funeral rites were solemnized by bishop ken who read the burial office and the whole evening service at all hallows barking on the occasion ken deprived of his see thus for the last time exercised his ministry within the church of england south aisle beneath the window at the east end of this aisle the colleton monument from the chisel of schneemakers almost rivals its neighbour in the north aisle by its heavy dullness but the altar tomb against the south wall is an early monument worthy of careful examination like the croke altar tomb already described it dates back to the fifteenth century and is the more ancient of the two 
a gilt brass plate at the back of the tomb is graven with a representation of the resurrection it is not now possible to ascertain to whose memory the tomb was erected possibly it commemorates the founder of a chantry chapel attached to this chancel aisle the beautifully carved font cover executed in whitened wood not plaster as many suppose is the work and some think the masterpiece of grinling gibbons whose incomparable works of art the carving of fruit and flowers and decorative scroll work in wood are to be seen in other parts of this church in other city churches and in many a manor house and ancient hall throughout england this font cover will repay the most careful study gibbon's signature so to speak may be found in the split pea-pod near the feet of one of the figures the brasses in this aisle are of singular interest the elaborate brass near the altar tomb with its ornamental border is a fifteen forty six memorial to william ten one of the masters of the household under henry the eighth he was the first to edit a complete edition of chaucer's works to show that england had her classics as well as other nations when this brass was taken up and restored in eighteen sixty one it was found to be engraved on both sides the supposition is that at the dissolution of the monasteries when many treasures found their way into the markets as one writer puts it with just a touch of cynicism a large brass which had covered the tomb of some dignitary of the church was cut down to the size of the figures we see on this tine slab and the back of the former engraving became the front of the present one tyne married anne daughter of william bond esq of the city of london who now lies by his side he left three daughters and one infant son francis who became a distinguished antiquarian and held the officer of lancaster herald the extreme youth of this child prevented his inheriting his father's prestige at court which in consequence descended to his nephews one of whom was sir john tyne of longleat founder of the noble house of bath the small circular brass thirteen eighty nine near by bearing an inscription in norman french is the oldest in the city and records the resting-place of william tong a generous benefactor to all hallows in the fourteenth century the larger ruch brass laid down in fourteen ninety eight has had its precatory invocation erased by the overzealous puritans but is otherwise in good preservation the engraving is rough and bold the details of the costume are true to contemporary drawings of the period and the position of the dog will recall what was said with regard to the tracings on the verbi stone on the north aisle farther west lies the rawson brass dated fifteen eighteen also mutilated by the iconoclasts of the mid seventeenth century the central figure is that of christopher rawson free man of the ancient guild of the mercers and the other figures represent margaret and agnes his wives in his will he mentions a chantry in the chapel of st anne in the church of all hallows barking where prayers for his own soul and the souls of his wives and children were to be said canon mason in an article which appeared in the nineteenth century for may eighteen ninety eight says from a theological point of view this is perhaps the most interesting monument in the church from the mouths of the three figures issue scrolls which unite over their heads in an invocation to the blessed trinity but these scrolls are in one respect unique reference is made to the wording of the scrolls salva nos libera nos and iustificat nos o beata trinitas save us and deliver us are of course expressions common enough vivificat nos quicken us occurs in a similar context in medieval services but search may be made without finding anywhere else i believe in liturgical formulas or in sepulchral inscriptions another example of justify us in the year fifteen eighteen the controversies about justification raised on the continent by luther had not begun to convulse england and indeed rawson's invocation takes no side in the controversy he does not say whether he hopes to be justified by faith or justified by works but he has laid hold upon the long-forgotten word and craves that the blessing contained in it 
whatever that might consist of may be given to him and to his wives the bassano slab of sixteen twenty four lies above one of the king's servants and the adjoining tomb of dame anne masters who died in seventeen nineteen records the wife of sir h masters city alderman and mother of nineteen children which goodly company of descendants occupy much burial space round the rawson tomb on one of the pillars of this aisle a sadly dilapidated brass plate commemorates william armour a governor of the pages of honour to henry the eighth edward the sixth mary and elizabeth who died in fifteen sixty his wife's burial is entered in the registers against may first fifteen sixty three she is the lady to whom according to the privy purse expenses of henry the eighth payments were made for cambric and making the king's shirts the daily services of the church were continued in this aisle without intermission during the progress of the work of restoration choir as we walk back towards the east end and turn into the choir portion of the chancel we may notice two quaint semicircular seats at the foot of the pillars on the altar steps these forms were made out of the wood of the old roof removed in eighteen fourteen the choir stalls of solid oak are comparatively recent additions to the building and bear some fine carving representing the fellowship of the angelic with the animal world these stalls are constructed to accommodate the clergy of the mission college of all hallows barking as well as the members of the choir the seat of the warden of the college and vicar of the parish is that which faces east in mentioning the vicar and clergy we may here fitly recall many of the men who have served at the altar of all hallows and whose names have not been lost to fame there is preserved a tabular list of the vicars since the presentation to the living of william collis on march second thirteen eighty seven chatterton thirteenth vicar was as we have already seen appointed dean of the free chapel of barking by richard the third carter appointed in fifteen twenty five was a friend of wolsey's and resigned in the year of the cardinal's fall fifteen thirty dawes fifteen forty two to fifteen sixty five was the first protestant incumbent and possessed many of the attributes of the vicar of bray as sketched in the verses of the old song wood fifteen eighty four fifteen ninety one was the first vicar appointed by the archbishop of canterbury ravis vicar from fifteen ninety one to fifteen ninety eight was one of the translators of the present authorized version of the bible as was also his successor at all hallows dr tig the twenty-fifth vicar edward layfield appointed in sixteen thirty five was a nephew of archbishop laud layfield was deprived in sixteen forty two by an ordinance of the house of commons under circumstances of considerable barbarity he was interrupted during the performance of divine service dragged out of church while the walls of the old church resounded to the shrieks of an infuriated mob within and without the building set on a horse with his surplice not removed the common prayer-book tied around his neck and in this manner forced to ride through the city then he was thrown into prison and no provision made for his maintenance whatever layfield was restored to his living on the return of charles the second his contemporaries describe him as a man of generous and noble spirit great courage and resolution and much respected in his parish though a high churchman vicar during the plague and fire he died in sixteen eighty and was buried here in the chancel dr hicks appointed in sixteen eighty one was one of the most remarkable and highly educated men of his generation and on the accession of william and mary refused to take the oaths was deprived of all his preferments and became a non-juror he was a friend of pepys and that volatile product of the restoration period often lamented dr hicks's long and dull sermons hicks attended pepys as he lay on his deathbed and many references to this vicar of all hallows will be found in the diary the present body of mission clergy attached to the church have their college in trinity square on tower hill they do excellent work for the church at large travel to all parts of england constantly and to far parts of the world occasionally 
to preach and conduct missions in this way the revenue of all hallows a seemingly large sum to the man in the street who usually remains there to scoff at useless city churches is taken up to the last penny for this most valuable and useful work the college was established in eighteen eighty three and many men known far and wide for their work in the church i may instance dr collins now bishop of gibraltar have been members of it its first head was dr a j mason now master of pembroke college cambridge to whom all hallows is indebted for the restoration of the north porch and the gift of the upper schoolroom his successor the present warden dr arthur w robinson has since carried on the arduous duties of the college and has brought all departments of the work in connection with all hallows as a parish church up to a point of remarkable efficiency never was the old building more zealously served than it is now and never has it been better used by parishioners and by others whose daily work lies in the city a numerous congregation consisting of those who come up from the eastern suburbs by the early trains and have an hour to spare before beginning work assembles here every weekday morning at eight o'clock the service consists of prayers a hymn a short address and an organ recital the sunday congregations are large for a city church especially in the evenings and on two or three occasions during the year the church is crowded beyond the actual seating capacity an inspiring sight when viewed from the organ loft chancel and nave in the chancel between the choir stalls may be seen the james brass of fifteen ninety one with figure about three feet in length also the brass of sixteen twelve to mary wife of john burnell merchant burnell presented a communion table to the church in sixteen thirteen the last brass but the most famous and artistic of all is that large square sheet of latin which is set in the pavement to the west of the litany desk it dates back to fifteen thirty and is a memorial of andrew evangar citizen and salter and ellen his wife the puritan defacements are only too plain yet in spite of this it is possible to decipher the beaten out lettering which ran of your charity pray for the souls of blank on whose souls jesu have mercy amen this brass is one of the finest specimens of flemish workmanship in england its only rivals are brasses at ipswich and st albans it is unnecessary to describe it in detail it can best be studied from the framed rubbing which stands behind the squire screen in the south aisle the very fine jacobean pulpit was erected before england had a single colony there it has stood during the rise of the british empire and it has survived many a storm in church and state though the pulpit dates back to sixteen thirteen the sounding-board above was erected in sixteen thirty eight and is termed in the vestry minutes of that year the new pulpit head this sounding-board is inscribed on each of its sides with the motto ex tem pedicum crucifixum which reminds us that whether the preacher in that pulpit looks south or east or west his one subject is to be christ crucified the fine sword rests rising above the choir screen behind the vicar's stall were erected by successive lord mayors and bear their respective crests with the city coat of arms the one on the south side the smallest of the three was erected in seventeen twenty seven by lord mayor isles that in the centre commemorates the mayoralty of slingsby bethel esq in seventeen fifty five while the remaining one was put up in seventeen sixty when sir thomas chitty a parishioner of all hallows was appointed chief citizen after examining the graceful ironwork of the sword rest the delicate wrought iron design beneath the pulpit rail should by no means be passed over the choir screen itself as well as the screens behind the churchwarden's pews at the back of the church is worthy of study by all who are interested in old wood carving west end from north to south porch until the nineteen o four restoration there extended an ugly heavy gallery which made the entrance to the church from either side very gloomy now the former organ loft is rebuilt and the interior of the church by this alteration regains the open appearance of earlier times 
in the entrance chamber of the tower there is preserved a very fine leaden water cistern on which appear the date seventeen o five and the letters a h b the monogram of the church while in the tower itself there hangs a peal of finely toned bells eight in number which in eighteen thirteen replaced the bells hung in sixteen fifty nine when the present tower was new the first organ in this church was that one already spoken of built by anthony duddington in fifteen nineteen though all trace of this very early instrument is lost the original indenture still remains dr hopkins says this is the earliest known record of the building of an organ in england in sixteen seventy five seventy seven the present organ case was erected by thomas and renatus harris and the organ then consisted of great and choir manuals only but a third manual the swell was added in the eighteenth century hatton describes the organ case as he saw it in seventeen o eight as enriched with fames and the figure of time and death carved in basso relievo and painted above the organ was improved by gerard smith in seventeen twenty and again in eighteen thirteen it was again overhauled and enlarged by bunting in eighteen seventy two and eighteen seventy eight was partially burnt in eighteen eighty and restored very badly indeed in eighteen eighty one on sunday third november nineteen o seven during evensong this ancient instrument broke down and was not used again the choral services were sung by the choir either entirely unaccompanied or supported by a pianoforte played in the chancel the instrument is now being rebuilt by messrs harrison and harrison of durham and this well-known firm have the problem before them of preserving what is of historic interest in the old organ and incorporating that in the newer and more efficient mechanism of the organ of to-day a complete list of organists of this church from sixteen seventy six to the present day has been preserved the large and fully equipped music-room in the northwest angle of the building is where the daily practices of the choristers are held in addition to the fittings incidental to the work of the choir it contains some interesting photos of the church and two old parish plans the royal arms above the door on the side of the organ loft used in georgian days to hang above the altar a spacious music or schoolroom lies over the north porch and this portion of the building though modern is quite in keeping with the ancient church to which it is attached of that old church we now take leave though great the history it has already made there is perhaps as great a history for it yet to make end of chapter six end of the tower of london by arthur poyser